biggest poison in us is regret. <clears throat> it's poison. And I push so hard, so hard, and will through my vehicle, which isn't meditation, which isn't health and wellness, which isn't nonprofit. My vehicle's business. I can't help it. It's what I love. I love building businesses. I love competing with you. I want to beat you. I love that game. But through that vehicle, I will always push a lack of regret and awareness to how good it really is. You're more than welcome to tell me about how bad it is or why you can't because or what, but it's just not true. Because if anybody ever did it, then you can too. Stop making excuses. Stop complaining. Nobody's listening. They may make pretend they're listening. The market doesn't care. What you need to do is make one person happy, you. Then you can make everybody else happy. You know why I like making people happy? Because I'm already happy. And so I implore you to take this last little rant and really look at your fucking face and understand, are you doing the things that are putting you in a position to succeed? Not just in a business world, but in life. Because it's super important because boy, when you're happy in life, your fucking business can roll. And so I'm just, trying to figure it out, and I've been trying to figure it out in front of you for the last seven, eight years, trying to figure out the unlocks, EQ, IQ, self-awareness, hustle. I don't know what they are, you know why? Because like I told my man, it's 330 different unlocks. And so I'll go to all of them, they're all tried and true, and one might hit you, yeah, it was hard work, because I'm actually lazy. I talk a good game, but I'm full of shit. Or it might be something else, but fuck, one. And so, you, you just had to sit. You're into this, right? That's good, right? This is good shit. You gonna remember this? Good. One fucking life. One life, my friends, one time. And honestly, I'll leave you with this because a lot of you need it. How you make your money is more important than how much you make. All right, you gotta figure out how to stop that. Okay, cool. Well, Mike, thanks for joining us today. How you doing? Good, hope you are. Yes, very good. So I, I, I always like tuning into a little bit of Gary V. You know, he can get a little uh, foul mouth, but I like his message, right? So um, a happy life equals, uh, well, what he said was, he's happy so he likes making other people happy so this this doing this stuff makes me happy and uh so i appreciate dean and jared for joining right now I, as usual more people will join in as we go along and so if it stays a little bit of a smaller group maybe we just open it all up and have a little bit of a discussion after we get going a little bit but let me introduce mike and then i'll have him kind of introduce himself as well and then we'll get rolling so uh, Mike's a North Carolina native. Um, Mike Ivey has worked in the real estate industry for 28 years um, and gave him the vision for equity wholesalers. He began his career assisting area residents to secure quality housing and providing um, home repairs at reasonable rates. Uh, Mike initially began the company as a home renovation service company providing reliable remodeling services to Charlotte area homeowners. Later with his experience and knowledge of the business and the partnerships of a select group um, of other area craftsmen, Ivy began acquiring distressed area properties and turning them into homes of distinction using the knowledge he gained as a hands-on tradesman. Sorry, I'm letting people in. I got to let people in now as we go along. So uh, Zoom <laughs> changed their, their protocol. So if you see me clicking people in, that's what I'm doing. In recent years, Mike has expanded his brand to include rental properties, commercial, uh, and wholesale properties real estate investment coaching and various mortgage lending programs. Uh, Mike has brought in his network by speaking at investor forums, publishing real estate investment articles and doing radio informatives. He is an af a active affiliate member of several groups and organizations such as uh, REO professionals, real estate investing professionals, global investors, real estate open networkers, Charlotte real estate exchange, commercial real estate professionals and AAU sports organizations. Um, active in multiple youth and church related community programs over the years. Mike enjoys various sports and family activities in his spare time. So anyway, there's Mike Ivey. I wanted to uh, 
add a little bit of, you know, how I met Mike. So this just goes to the power of, you know, different networks that you're in um, throughout life. So I, I, the CrossFit gym I go to, um, there was a guy there that, that used to attend with me named Daryl, right? And Daryl and I were talking about what we do. Daryl's an insurance agent and, um, um, and Daryl was telling me about this buddy he has that he used to do deals with named Mike Ivy in North Carolina, right? So that's how I met Mike is uh, through a connection at my gym. And then Mike then introduced me to uh, somebody that he was going to be doing some work for and building a house for. And I ended up providing a loan for that person. And Mike on that job was the contractor, right? So I believe that's how we met Mike. Does that sound about right? Yep. I see it. Awesome. Well, if you don't mind, fill in the blanks a little bit with what I missed. If you'll just kind of kind of take us through, you know, growing up in, you know, just briefly, right? Growing up in North Carolina, how you got into real estate and, um, you know, just kind of some of the different high level projects you've done. And then we'll kind of dive into some details. Well, I have been, I'm born and raised here in Charlotte. I haven't been anywhere. Just kind of stay right here in my little nest. And probably, I guess, 28 years ago, me and a buddy of mine, I, was, I had a landscape company and he had a paint company and we had the same accountant. Okay. And we went over to see the accountant one day, it just happened to be, he was taking his paperwork and I was taking mine and the accountant was sitting there and the accountant had rental property. And he told us, look, you guys need to get some things for some deductions you might want to think about buying some rental property. So we had no clue, had no nothing. It's not like it is now. You can't get on the internet and find things then. So we went out and bought four houses that didn't need any work. I mean, they were, we probably, we, well, we did overpay for them, but we didn't have to work on them because neither one of us knew anything about it. <laughs> so, I was the one in charge of doing the work. So I kind of learned from that on how to do the work. I still, we still have those houses to this day and I still go over there when I have to fix something and I look at it and I say, man, who fixed that? And it was me way back then. So it's kind of a trial and error and has been ever since. But I've uh, covered everything from fix and flips to wholesaling and just buying and holding right now because I think the market's at the point now where, yes, it's good for sellers, but I think there's has more to offer a little bit further as we go into this. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so that's really interesting. So your first deals, you bought four rentals you know, back when you maybe didn't know what you were doing, but you still own those four rentals today? Yes, we still so, still have them. We get offers on them daily and they're good offers. It's just, you know, it's just, we just don't want to sell them yet. So what you, what? just curious, what, what did you buy those in North Carolina for 28 years ago? Oh, 28 years ago, we found a guy that was, that would do owner financing for us. And we gave him 48000 for the house. And then the other three, the most we paid was sixty back then. Okay. So, and uh, those houses now are worth two sixty. And did you keep uh, your original loans or seller finance loans in place this whole time? I mean, I'm guessing they're maybe paid off now or maybe you've relevered them to get capital for other projects. No, they're actually paid off. We did keep them. We did make every single payment. I mean, I, for gosh, the guy did the first one for 17 years. So for 17 years, at first of the month, I visited the flower shop and gave the guy my check for a hundred and thirty eight dollars or whatever it is. And I went there every single month myself. And then I took him the last check and he told me I had a seventeen dollar late fee. <laughs> and I said, From when? I've been coming to see you, but he was really old. I said, All right, well 
you know, here's the $17. He said, all right, we'll come back next week. I'll have your, you know, your release signed and pick it up. Well, I went back the next week and the guy had passed away. Oh, no way. Yep. But he had signed everything for me, but he had, yeah, he passed away. I saw him all them years. We became good friends. Yeah. And I made my last payment to him and he died a week later, you know, and it was just, it was just all of a sudden too. So, but, uh, but yeah, well, that, uh, that was a good deal back then. Well, that's a great deal. Anytime, anytime you can get terms like that and a 17 year amortization, right? Like that's, that's yeah. awesome. So, well, that's a great start to your real estate investing journey when you just bought four and that's a really cool story though, too, for all of us that maybe are buying your first one or your, you know, whatever your, your second one. And you, you know, you're, you're very new to owning rentals. You're, man, 28 years later, you're sitting on free and clear properties where, you know, just those four alone are, you know, million plus, right? So that, that's a great way to do it. It just takes a little bit of time. Oh yeah. It's definitely a time deal. And that's why you don't want to really rush because it's real simple to make mistakes. Yeah. And like I tell everybody, you can't, it's not like Walmart. You can't take it back and get your money back. Right. It just don't work like that. I mean, it's, you know, so you just really need to be patient and get what works best for you. And, uh, you know, because a lot of times back when we were doing it, we were accumulating a lot and we were sitting there saying, well, okay, we're making, you know, $200 extra a month, which was fine. But when you had a tenant move out, you wound up paying five thousand yeah. for the uh for the fix up so if you you know that didn't make it very good and then when the crash of the real estate market you know if we didn't have a little bit saved up we would have been in a lot of trouble then so you just got to kind of get what fits you best so right now your game you you obviously still have rentals right and i'm sure you've bought more over the years, you've probably sold some over the years, but, but, but you got rentals right now that you're working with, right? Yes. And you mentioned, you, let's talk about some of these in a minute. Yeah. I know you have some Airbnbs, Aaron, who's on the call with us locally, Aaron, Aaron's and his wife are professional kind of like Airbnb and not just Airbnb, but short-term and long-term property managers. So anybody that's on the call right now and don't know Aaron Havens, reach out to him if you need help with uh, Airbnb or, or rentals. But so you have Airbnbs. I know you've done um, a lot of work as a contractor and rehabber for yourself as well as for other people. Um, you do wholesaling, cash bars, maybe just kind of paint a picture of where you're at today and what your overall business looks like, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month. Well, as of today, I have strictly had to go to just um, dealing with the rentals. I don't um, do any more work for people. You know, if it's a friend or something, yes, but I've just been doing my own, you know, I've been buying the houses and doing a lot of the work myself or with, you know, with my guys that I've had for forever. So right now we're just concentrating on buying stuff. And if we decide to hold it, we'll still fix it and put a tenant in it. And if if not, we'll fix it to sell it. But it's my own, it's what I'm buying. It's not, yeah. uh, it's not anything, you know, like when we did the deal with Tracy, me and you, I helped her with that one. That was pretty much the last one I did. Um, because it takes a lot of time to do it and a lot of energy. So I just kind of stepped back and started concentrating on just what I'm doing. And if yeah. So I want to, I want to drill down on that. And then that, that rehab that you did for the loan I did for that borrower out there in, in your area, that, that was not, that, that really wasn't a remodel. That was like, a remodel and new construction all in one, right? Like, I mean, yes. you guys ended yeah. up adding like 2000 square feet and it was a huge budget and you guys 
had huge value creation with that one. Yes, that was, uh, and right now with the people that can, with the group, I don't know how it is down there, but for us in Charlotte, everybody's looking for the bigger, better deal and they want it new. Like when we did that rehab, the guy, we sold the lot to the guy next door. Well, yeah, he built, right. yep, he built a brand new house and then we rehabbed the house that we had and then he sold his house for um, eight eighty nine. Wow. Well, the rehab house, the rehab house sold for one hundred twenty five thousand less because of the newness. Because people don't understand when they look at a house and say the year it was built is nineteen fifty four, but it's brand new. They don't put two and two together. They start, you know, saying, "Well, you know, if it's not new, 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 then." you know, we don't want to fool with it. We want new. They don't like the character. They don't care about the character. They don't care about what it was and what it became. They just want new. Well, it's, that's always a hard call as a rehabber. I, in fact, I was just talking with a potential borrower earlier today. He has a, a, a property in Draper where he's subdivided and he has two kind of flag lots behind the current home, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's committed to build spec homes on those back ones. And the front house is like 4,700 square feet. And, you know, he's budgeted to put $360,000 to remodel the front house. And I'm like, dude, you're crazy. Like, just tear that thing down and build something brand new. Even if you spend, you know, four, 450, just like your point, you're going to get way more out of it. So I, I think as rehabbers and flippers, we've all fallen into that trap <laughs> where we yeah. think we'll just remodel a house. And sometimes we'd be a lot better off just tearing it down. Uh, Heston's on the call. I know Heston visited my house there. I had on ninth East about last year. I, I mean, that was a prime example. I should have just torn that thing down. I spent 130,000 on like a 1500 square foot house and I would have been a lot better off just tearing it down. But Sometimes you don't know, like you said, it's not like Walmart, you can't return it, right? So sometimes once yep. you've committed to it, you just got to finish that thing. Yeah, and, it's, and that's very true. But nowadays, I used, I never tore any down, ever. And I've done, you know, I've done nine on one street. Oh, really? It used to, yeah, it used to be that you could do that, but the times have kind of changed to where, you know, in the inner city and stuff, they want, they want the new. Yeah. Because some of the neighborhoods, some of the neighborhoods, you have to tear the house down anyway. But nowadays, it's just not worth it on the rehab end, unless you're doing, you know, something that you can go in and fix. If you're adding a second story or you're adding, you know, major stuff, it is not, um, really worth it to me it's not and the ones that i've you know the ones that we've done the difference in what the old and new is selling for us it doesn't you could do new and still make more money yeah right 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 no i agree and it's a little bit more predictable new right like you don't have all those yes. twists and turns of you know right of a, of a gnarly remodel um, oh yeah, it's all, you got to marry the two, and if you can't, if you don't know how to marry the two, then you're in trouble from the old to the new. You, because especially like my architect that I have, he's golden. He can put, he can marry two together and still and make it look like it a craftsman style. And we've always sold them good, and we sold them quick. But now it's just getting to the point where you know, just tear the thing down and start over new. It may, you can do it quicker and it's, it's better product for the people that are coming up that have Googled all this, you know, dry pro under the crawl space and everything else. So that's what they know. Yeah. Versus looking under crawl space on an old house and ooh, what, what's all that? So yeah. Right. Just, yeah. Well, in, in Salt Lake, I think a lot of that's happening, especially closer to the downtown areas where, I mean, 
lot values are inching up, but you can some you can get crazy prices for stuff brand new, and it almost mm -hmm. justifies the 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 lot value. I have a couple borrowers right now for the guys that are local here on on Milton. John Maxim has a house on on Milton that basically tore it down. It was kind of a firehouse anyway. I think he was into his lot like two fifty, and and he's selling the you know the final product for like eight eight fifty. It's just you know, right, yeah. it's insane. And if he would have remodeled that house, I don't even know if he'd have the same spread that he has just by tearing it down. So, I mean, I think those are good opportunities in like, you know, good, solid, high priced areas um, where you can pull that off. So, all right. One other fun fact that's different from flipping and investing in Utah versus North Carolina. How many shirts do you go through a day? <laughs> four, four a day. It's a four <laughs> shirt day. It's a four shirt day. Yeah. That's how you could tell how hot it is, right? How many shirt day it that's is. It. <laughs> that's it. When you get around here in Charlotte, you you understand what the what it means to drive down the road and the guy's got a shirt tied to a side mirror airing it out so he can wear it again for the days out, letting it dry. So that's what you see around here. So you guys go through a lot of laundry detergent, I'm guessing, in, yes. uh, in North Carolina. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you can tell the ones that don't. <laughs> <laughs> you can smell the ones that don't. Yeah, right? that's it. Stay All away right, from so, them. So talk about talk about some of these. If you've been buying and holding a lot of properties lately and not necessarily flipping, I guess the first question is, how are you finding them? Because I know you have a, a you know a presence online with you know how are you finding your deals first, and then second. Let's walk through some numbers on one because I know the other part of what you do is, is you work with a lot of investors from other states that are investing with you in Charlotte, right? So, so maybe first start with now, what are you doing looking for deals? And then what has worked in the past that maybe doesn't work now? Like talk about a little bit of, of the way you find deals. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a tip or trick that, that we can all implement in our own market and in our own, you know, deal well, flow. Well, really for me is um, I do have the guys that do the cold calling. I'm out so much. When I'm out, always I'm writing down addresses and everything. And then I've got a guy that I send that to who I grew up with. So we, you know, he's a Charlotte native too. So I'll send that to him and he's, you know, he'll get on been verified and places like that and start calling numbers to see if he can get a hold of somebody and we do the wholesalers around we do work with them some we try to uh we try to if we're working with them we try to work with them enough that we can get help them with pricing because what they're looking at is hey, this guy said he wanted a hundred for this house. So the wholesaler said, well, okay, because all he's going to try to do is make five grand. He don't know if, you know, really, if he can get that or not. Yeah. So we try to help them do the research and say, okay, here's what we'll pay. So you try to get, you know, in this range, so you can make some money. Um, and a lot of that's from, you know, just people that you deal with regularly because i'll get calls um all the time with hey i'm looking at this house over in the neighborhood and i'll you know i'll look it up if i don't already know the neighborhood and say well you know here's what i'm thinking where you should be you know talk to the guy see what he says um and then he'll always leave it open-ended where if the guy's not responsive or whatnot then I can call the guy as a cold call to see what he uh, see what he tells me. Um, so we do, and I do do some advertising. Um, I don't do mailers. I don't do flyers. Um, I've got a guy here that is a computer whiz, and I do the the, uh, the tracking where. If you go online and look for the guys that are really, really advertising here in Charlotte, if you go online and pull theirs up, it'll give you a number that you can call. Well, you're calling me. Um, so it lets the affiliation, you know, of real estate 
um, it lets them call me and then I can talk to them. And obviously they got him too that they can call. So, um, so is see. that like a shared marketing or lead generation system? It, it is. Um, and there's some that, um, and there's some that will go to, they'll just go to my website and just call me. They won't necessarily go to theirs. So it's kind of, uh, the way it's set up is just the clicks, the way, it, the way, like if you were looking at something and you clicked on, on one of me, then you, it would take you to me and give you all the information and everything else. And you'd call or email or however you want to do it. So it actually for a consumer, it gives them a couple of different people they can call, but most of the time they just call that one number. Well, what's the name of that? I'm wondering if it's something that is I will have, available I'll, here. I'll have, I'll have to give it to you. I'll okay. get it from him because, you know, my computer skills are looking up properties and uh, looking up people. I don't know. Uh, other than that, that's it. Well, so this is, I, this is really good. I like having a bunch of different personalities and different levels of experience and focus on these calls because it highlights different techniques or strategies that, that, that work for anyone, you know, and you just got to do it your own way. Right. Like from when I hear you talking about the way you're deal sourcing to me, it sounds like you are just a hundred percent, a relationship guy that hustles, that, that leverages what you're not good at with what someone else is good at. Like, you know, you have the guy that will call for you, your job mm -hmm. is just to drive and then, you know, write down and pass it along. Right. And so, um, that's great. So wholesalers you work with, you know, bird dogs, um, some online presence that you piggyback off of some other marketing. And then you have some cold callers that do some of that stuff for you to generate leads and properties. How, how, how many wholesalers would you say are in the Charlotte area? Is it, I mean, in Utah, it feels like, you know, we get a million emails a day from wholesalers, right? Like they're all over the oh, place. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a million of them here in Charlotte and only one of them has any money. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, I can, I can, I can tell you from the ones that I know in Charlotte and they put out the bandit signs and everything else, all they're doing is trying to figure out what the ones that do have the money want so they can go find it and sell it to you. You know, they don't have, they're not buying anything. Interesting. They're just they're just out there, you know, trying to see what they can find. And a lot of them, it hurts a lot of times because if a wholesaler will go out there and they'll look at the house, they don't really know what they're looking at. And they're talking to the guy and the guy will say what he wants for the house. Well, you know, that sounds good to them. They don't have anything tied up in it. So all they got to do is try to sell it and make, 2500 or five grand off of it so then in the guy's mind the selling it he thinks okay well it's worth that that's what the last guy gave me but the last guy didn't close it right, you right. Know, that's why it's not worth that so it's kind of uh you know there's a few good ones here in charlotte um but other than that it's just you know people going, trying to just make their little bit, which is fine. I'm all for that. I, I don't, I don't mind paying people. I pay everybody that, that sends me a lead. If I do the deal, I pay them. I don't, I don't mind paying at all, but I don't want it to be roint. You know, if we have to go back and say, well, look, you know, here's what your house is really worth. And then the guy's, you know, he thinks you're trying to who doing. Right. So it's, uh, you know, we try to catch him beforehand and hopefully send him in the right direction. Or I'll just be straight up with him and say, look, it's a house that I would really like to have. I'll pay you five grand. Let me call the guy. Yeah, right. And I'll deal, I'll deal with him and I'll sign a piece of paper saying that, you know, you're going to get, 
your money and you can send the invoice to the attorney, you know, that's fine and you'll get paid. So the ones that are in my neighborhoods that I like to work, I try to get them to let me do it and, and they still get paid. It's a trust, but you know, a lot of them, a lot of them do that. Again, it goes back to like your character and your experience and your reputation in the area, right? Like a new yes. guy coming into town wouldn't be able to pull that off. I, I have that relationship with the guy here as well. He's kind of a bird dog. He's found me, I don't know, probably 15 houses at least over the years. And at first, you know, he's kind of hesitant, right? Cause he's, mm -hmm. he's not quite sure if I'm going to backdoor it or whatever. And we've gotten to the point now where if he needs money, I'll even just pay him the commission or the fee before I close, you know, knowing right. that I'm going to close and, and vice versa. He'll, he'll hand it off to me once he's already kind of set that relationship and, and teed it up and whatever. So, so again, again, I think this is the theme for kind of this call with you. It's, it's kind of building your business through longevity, being in the market, being consistent, having a good reputation and, really networking, right? I mean, you're part of a lot of different groups. You're involved yeah. in churches and with your kids' athletics and stuff like that, right? Yeah, it is. I do a good bit of networking. And, uh, and you know, you never know who may have a house they want to sell or know somebody. So, I mean, they, you know, everybody knows around me if they want to make a few extra dollars, they just need to send me some houses. I'll work them from there. My kids send me lists all the time when they're out riding around you know they they can stand to make an extra five grand so they uh they'll send me a house or two um you know and stuff like that it's uh once people know that you're willing that they can make extra money just by saying hey i know johnny whose dad's passed away and he's gonna sell his house now and he don't know what to do so you know send me over there and Johnny comes away happy and you get paid. There you go. I love so, it. Well, let's, like talk about, let's talk about how, how you're setting up some of these deals you're buying now and what kind of numbers. Cause I know, I know you're always open and, and willing to work with, you know, people from out of state um, to invest, you know, with you in the Charlotte area. I, you know, I, I'm guessing maybe there's, different spreads there than what we're seeing here, but may, maybe think back to, you know, in the last couple months or whatever, the last three or four months, what, give me an example of one of the deals that you're working on right now. And maybe just let's kind of break down some of the numbers. Well, the, um, I have, um, and you'll appreciate this, but I've got, I've got one guy here locally that um, all he wants to do, he don't want to have nothing to do with nothing. He won't, he's got, money to spend and he wants to do real estate and he wants to make money in real estate but he don't want to he don't want to do nothing he wants to ride and look at the house and say okay let's do it and then we do it so the one that we're doing now um the lady went into a nursing home and the house has been sitting vacant for i don't know about a year and a half well her daughter just finally decided to sell it because the nursing home's calling wanting some money. So we went and we cut her a deal, which is an older house, but it's in a good neighborhood. We bought the house from her for 270, um, is what we bought it for. We did not touch it. We didn't do anything to it. I called uh, uh, my realtor buddy and said, just put it on the market and let's see what we can, let's put it on the market for 10 days. Let's just put it on there. I said, I've looked at the comps and he looked at the comps and we were pretty close to the number. So we put it on the market at 375. Our wow. first four, our first four offers the first day, one was for uh, 395, one was for 400 and one was for 405. Wow. So, you know, and we had no idea that it would generate that. We weren't prepared for that, but, you know, we did our numbers. We were comfortable with the numbers and we knew that if we had to drop down, we could drop down. So we were 
you know, we were still safe, but we're selling it to the guy at 405. And he's, uh, you know, he's slated to close, not this Friday, but next. So that is what I do with that guy. They're not all like that. I mean, there's sometimes, you know, we walk away with 10 grand, 15 grand. But well, it's yeah, still that's, a, that's a huge spread. And yeah. it was sourced from, you know, uh, someone you knew, a vacant house, right? Like, and then you got in there and worked the deal. Um, what, did you work the deal with the family or was she, did she sign the well, contract? What, well, what happened was my guy that I deal with, I sent him the address and he found the the actual, he found the daughter and called and her husband answered and said that he was handling it for her. So he said we could meet and look at the house. So we met and, you know, we had our mask on and everything because he's older fella. So we had to have our mask on. So there's nothing like wearing a mask, looking at an outside of a house at a 101 degree day <laughs> and you're already sweating. So, uh, you know, so we did that and, um, you know, we literally cut the deal with him right there because he said, he said, look, you know, here's what we want, you know? And, um, so we looked at it and what I was have to figure out on our end, okay, if we rent it, what can we get for rent? How much is it going to cost to fix it? You know, or is this one we just take our chances, put it on the market and sell. So I had done my comps and kind of knew where I wanted to be. So at that point, after talking with him, I told him that we would take it, you know, at his price and uh, go ahead and close it. So he was happy. And obviously, you know, if the guy that we're dealing with closes, you know, we'll be happy too, but it's, uh, but it's, you know, it's, that's rare. It really is because it just happens to be in a good neighborhood. They're building a lot of houses. So it's, uh, you know, it was, it, it just, ha it was just a good deal that we got stumbled upon, which, you know, I'll take them once a year. Seems like this, that'll be good. Well, but that only happens is because you're in the game all the time, right? Because right, yeah. you, you go through plenty of those other, like, you know, make five grand or make seven grand or, or you know, maybe lose money here and there. But mm -hmm. you've got to be in the game consistently and long enough to catch those breaks. And then you're yeah, right, yeah. you'll catch that break. I think I have one right now, kind of similar, where an agent that I work with, I've actually done some loans for him. He reached out and he just wasn't in the right spot at the right time to buy this property. And, and I closed on it. And I think I got, I think it's kind of similar. I think I got a really, really good one for a good price because, you know, the seller was in kind of an interesting situation and I think it'll be a huge profit one, like kind of similar to what you're dealing with. But so go back to this investor. How, how do you finance your deals? It sounds like you partner with different people. And in this case, this one, did he provide all the money for you guys to purchase it? Yes, that's, that's his deal. Since he is not doing absolutely nothing, that was his deal. He said, look, I'll put the money up. We'll split the profits. Got it. And so what I do with him is if I find a house, I'll send him the house and all the information and obviously let him do whatever it is he wants to do to see if, my values are right or see what he thinks and then he will you know have a say in it because he's he's done real estate yeah he sure. just for for me it make for having me makes it easy for him he can do whatever he is doing during the day and you know we're out here looking for houses and if we find something you know and he's not the good thing about him is he's not greedy so if the spread tightens up you know he's not one to say ah, nah you know we made this on the last one we need to make this on the you know on the next one he's not he's not like that at all <clears throat> yeah he gets so it it. just yeah so i mean it, and you and you have to because you know you never ever know you know none of us have a crystal ball so 
you just hope to go on what you uh, what you know. And but, uh, but that's a great way to works. set up a deal. And you found a match where that guy fits. That guy has what you don't have, or not that you don't have it, but you know, he maybe just doesn't want to do anything but for, provide the money, right? And then you're going to go out right. and execute the deal. So I, I think for all of us that are you know that will watch this call, there's there's probably a, a light switch that went on. There's Sometimes I have the tendency that I, I want to try and do all of it and be all of it, but I know one takeaway I'm going to take from this call is drill down on that leverage and whether it's someone specific like that, I mean, that's why you got to hire out and, and let people do what you don't want to do. I don't necessarily love cold calling. I don't like following up on the vacant houses. I love buying them, you know, but I, I do the best when I've, when someone else has connected me with the deal, then I can make yeah. sense of it really quick figure out the way to buy it and move fast. I just don't, that's why I've, I'm like you, I've never really done too much marketing um, on my own. I've just relied on relationships, right? Like being there, right. networking, doing, and this is maybe some of the reason why I'm doing these calls, right? Is to continue to try and connect people that I know with, you know, my network and stuff like that. And, and, and as a quick aside, Mike, I'll, I'll maybe join you guys on a tech string sidebar after, but my buddy from North Carolina, Jason, just joined the call and, and he actually helped do a little bit of due diligence for me on that loan I did for you on that house. So um, Jason's a great guy and maybe there's a connection for you two to, to meet up in, in North Carolina and, and do some deals together. So. Yeah. I right. think we chatted, chatted one time or something. I'm not, I don't, I don't remember, but yeah, uh, yeah. I think we touch base. Cool. Well, Jason's a stud. So Jason, thanks for jumping on. Um, okay. We're, we got maybe 15 minutes left. A couple other things I wanted to touch on is, um, well, let's go back to this deal you bought for 270. What, what would that have rented for? Well, it would have, that's where the numbers were off a little bit. You would have to, it's, it's gonna, it would rent for about 1700. Okay. But it also had a garage that had a room above it. So that would get you another 600, um, but getting it fixed up to rent would be where you'd really get off on your numbers. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we're going to hold stuff, but we're going to hold stuff and, you know, try to make at least 10% on the money. Um, if not, it's just not worth it to hold them, you know, long term like that unless you're making that kind of money and so when you say that how you know how are you typically financing your rentals are you partnering with people that then carry the money and I, that 10 percent you're hoping you get back on like as a cash on cash or are you getting loans on all it sounds like you've gotten really creative over the years yeah no we're we most of our stuff we don't get loans on i have um i have a group out of China, um, and uh, and a group out of Australia, that that's you know they know what they want to make, so I put the deals together for them, and you know it's their way of putting cash in, and then they're done. You know, pretty much I'm so, handling things so and doing things on my end. They're just your private investors. They, it's, it's, it's almost like they're a bank partner, but they're not. So this, this is interesting. How, how do you, if you don't mind sharing, how do you set that up with that? Like, what is your split or how do you set that up on a long-term rental? Do you just pay them well, a preferred rate or? Well, see, I'm, I'm, I'm too easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm real easy with them. I let, I'll take, we will split the profits, but I let them take the rents, um, okay. you know, and obviously, and with that, if we have a fix up or something that, you know, becomes theirs. Um, but I will handle every single thing for them, you know, for the property. And then they're basically, when it comes time to sell, we're splitting the profits. Now, if the rents have carried more than what they were expecting, then obviously that is split up too, you know, based on how the rents did. And a lot of times, if you have fix up, the rents don't work out. So you're just splitting the profit. 
at the end when it's time to sell it because I am a huge, huge, I preach this, back end is the most important thing if you're going to do rentals. What's okay. it going to yeah. make you on the back end? Because you can buy a rental and keep it for 10 years and it'd be worth what you paid for it. And that's not what you want to do because you haven't made any money. Right. You, it's got to, it's got to really keep up with what's going on because in Charlotte, you're going to get three to 5%. Appreciate and that's, you. Yes. And that's, um, and in some areas it's 10 times that, but you know, you want to kind of, see what there is to offer, whether you close to downtown, you know, where it's at. <clears throat> so you can kind of, you know, get in those areas and they start moving the way you want them to. So, but for you as the investor putting the deal together, I, this is, this is, this is gold because there's probably so many people out there and maybe it's a little unique that you found these funds or these groups from China and, and Australia that, that are down with this, right? But if I understand it, they're they're kind of getting what they hope maybe a nine or ten percent return on their money through the rents, and then they're going to get a back end bump just like you will get. You're in it for that back end equity, you yes. know. When you so, do you guys agree ahead of time we're going to sell this in six years or ten years, or 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 how do you, you know, how do you structure that? Not really. I kind of let them make that call. They, I have my full input and they trust that now. And, um, so it's, um, it's kind of like my Australia group. We have chosen to sell a house and a lot. We bought the house and I wound up being able to subdivide the lot. I didn't think we were going to get it passed, but we did. So their money doubled. So yeah. they decided to go ahead and sell the house and the lot and put that money aside so we can see what's going to happen through COVID and everything and see if there's some investors turning some stuff loose or, you know, some stuff that's going back that we can pick up on, you know, to use that money. So that's, that's kind of where our agreement was. That's uh, awesome. So you, but, you have all these like little mini kind of like not surprises because you know where you know you know where they are but you've kind right. of built all these mini little paydays that are coming down the road when these properties decide to sell yeah i make uh i make i my my guys and i don't have i used to do a lot but i don't have many now um but it's a uh yeah i make i make them good money they're they're uh they're extremely happy well, so. and, and I can relate to that too. My investors that invest with me on the loans, you know, they're, they're little base hits for them, but they're very, very consistent. And, you know, that just adds up over time where, you know, you perform and, and you do a good job for them and protect their funds and their investment. And man, they, they end up being really, really loyal to you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, treat people right, network with the right people yeah. and get a little creative. Right. So we've got about, 10 minutes left. I know you have kind of your thoughts on, and on what COVID and the economy, I'd like to hear that kind of as we end. And it might be a little bit of a different perspective from us in Utah, right? Like from where your head's at in the middle of the, you know, and, or, you know, over in your neck of the woods, but, but where do you kind of see what's your strategy going forward for the next year or two? And, and what's kind of your gut telling you with all the experience you have over the years? Well, see here in, here in Charlotte, we don't take a big hit like a bunch of other places. Even now, we're getting multiple offers on houses and, you know, every day. And inventory is down, so that makes it, you know, that makes it even better for somebody to sell it. But I believe that um, some of these folks are going to, they've been, they haven't been paying their mortgage so they're going, some of this stuff's going to go back. I think that, uh, that we'll have a flurry of it towards the, uh, end of the year. And, um, I think there'll be some deals out there that, um, that if you can close quick, 
some people will be have some opportunities and I think with it being the end of the year the banks will be looking at not holding those houses either and will be willing to let some of these houses go on short sales and um, at a reduced rate because I don't know how it is down there but down here a lot of these banks are leaving these houses in these folks' name and letting them go till they can sell them. Right, right, And then right. it keeps it keeps them off their books, and it, you know, that just helps the bank out. So I think there'll be some good deals um, that come about. But again, the market's got to catch up with inventory. You know, I see some of the prices coming down on the lower end stuff. Um, so that kind of tells you that this going that way the higher end stuff's it it's the first thing to slow regardless of anything yeah right it'll slow it'll slow the quickest and um you know so we're kind of we're seeing a little bit of it but not as much as we want so there's some there's some people getting antsy out there that are willing to abandon ship now so it's kind of uh we're just kind of sitting back and picking and choosing whether we want to uh, do a deal or not. And sometimes that's not good because you miss out on things, but you know, who knows? It's, if it's a good deal, it's a good price. Everybody's for it. And you know, we yeah. are too. Well, and, and you've set up things from what, from what I understand in a, in a really smart way where you're not necessarily borrowing money you're partnering right and so the a deal that could go bad for someone else with maybe hard money or or you know not great financing isn't going to go as bad for you right because just the split right. may be smaller yeah. or whatever and yeah we around around here some of the hard money guys that i know you know i keep in contact with them because <clears throat> some of these deals these folks aren't able to finish because lumber prices have gone up to 25 percent almost so i mean some of them are turning upside down and some of the hard money guys like yourself you know you have to cut losses sometimes so mike comes in and helps you cut them losses you know it's funny you say that because i have a deal right now that we took back out in magna and it's different when you have your lender hat on versus your investor hat. And I get my hats mixed up every once in a while, right? Because I'm doing both, right? But um, I definitely volume wise, I'm doing more hard money. But it's funny you describe that situation because that's exactly what I have right now. I have a, have a framed house. It's an older house in Magna that we took back. We own it now as the lender. And I'm going like, man, I'd actually probably buy this at the price that we're owed if I was the investor. But when I'm the lender, I'm like, I don't want to deal with this, right? And so yeah. I have a, I reached out to a wholesaler and a wholesaler found me a buyer and I'm going to basically break even on the deal, right? But yeah. for me, it's worth it. It's like, great, take it off my hands and let me recycle that money and get it lent out on another deal. So yeah, you know, you're not losing money. You're making money because you got the money back out again, you know, from where it was. It's the, it's the hard headed ones that are waiting, feel like they've got to make money on that money instead yeah. of just being done. It's like the guy that wants to rent his house for 1600 and it's only worth 1300 He'll lose three months yeah. before he'll change it to 1300 and he's lost all that money. Yeah. People just, people just don't understand that. I don't know why, but they just some of the smartest people I know just do not understand that. Yeah. No, you and I think a lot alike. I'd rather just keep things moving, you know, do what I need to do to, you know, knowing that, like you said, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be another deal that comes along. If you miss one, yeah, that sucks. But, you know, keep your head yeah. up, keep looking. And, and um, yeah, that's great. That's great. All right, cool. Um, so anything specifically you're doing different? sounds like you're just kind of trying to liquidate when you can liquidate, make sure your investors and the guys backing you that have the money are going to be liquid and available to really kind of start trying to cherry pick if and when, you know, probably more when maybe 
things start slowing down and, and our market sounds like it's about as hot as yours, right? There's multiple offers on everything. There's super yeah, that's, inventory, that's, yeah. way more demand than supply, but you got to think that's going to change slowly here in the next six months to a year. Yeah, I think it'll pick up. That's why I don't, that's why we won't have another meltdown like we did before, even though a lot of people are out of work. Um, but the banks are going to stagger that out. So I think the inventory will pick up. It's just, you know, a matter of when it does. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, Mike, this has been great. I think this last little bit of the call, like all of it, but this last little bit of the call was gold for me, just kind of reinforcing you know, one, I want everyone to use hard money, right? Because you'll come to me. But yeah. the reality is, is, is it's not always the best way to go. And there's probably someone out there that knows somebody that could probably set up a situation similar to what you have with some of your guys. Mm -hmm. And it's great for them. And it's great for you. It takes the pressure off to not have this clock ticking with the interest. And the other thing that I, you know, was reminded just by talking to you is just be a good dude, talk to people, network, treat people right and yep. hustle and, and deals are going to be there. Right. But you also got to make that decision, do your analysis and then jump on it. Yeah. But I mean, hard money's, you know, I've, I've used it for a long time. I made Daryl a lot of money. You can ask him that I've made him a lot of money. So I, I use hard money, you know, when I, when I can and when I need to, especially if I'm doing something myself. Sure. But it's, uh, you know, it's pricey, but if it, the numbers work for you, what's, who cares how pricey it is? That's, yeah. yeah. You know, it gets you to your goal. Gets you to your goal. Yeah. I like it. Well, I dropped your phone number in the chat for the people that are on this call. If, if they have any questions, I, you know, reach out to you. If there's maybe deals in North Carolina, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe there's some new contacts that can be made. And, and, um, and just me personally, I need to pick up a few more rentals. And so if you have anything out there, you know, uh, small apartments or fourplexes, I know I'd be interested as well. So keep, keep okay. me in mind. And, and, um, and I know, I know y'all have a whole bunch of money down there. So just have them call me and uh, we'll see if we can't make them some more money. Okay. We'll just send it all to you. We're sending it all to you, Jason, <laughs> here in North Carolina. All yeah, right, well, Mike, bring it on. Thanks so much for joining and everybody that's on the call. Appreciate it. We'll see hopefully a lot of you guys in real life here coming up and um, if not online and we'll do this again next week. And Mike, have a great day, man. Uh, you too. Go to shirt number two. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks guys. Take it easy. Thank you.